I'm sure remembered to do something special for their wives or the boys for their girlfriends, etc. It was interesting, I found in, in, in researching uh, for this, uh, I didn't spend that much time researching this element of it, but you realize 73% of the, the flowers that are bought are by men. Uh, God forbid the other 27%, you know, that forgot. <laughs> 110 million roses actually come from Latin America. They don't come from this country. They're shipped up. When my uh, oldest son got married, his wife was from Bogota, Colombia, and I learned about the importance of Latin American flowers because the night before the wedding, we spent hours, literally hours, into the midnight, uh, all these boxes of flowers that just came in and the godmothers uh, of my uh, wife, my son's wife to be, were there and were working. And I learned a lot about flowers down in Latin America. Those of you who go to Peru see the beautiful arrangements in the marketplaces. It was interesting, too, that it said 15% of the women sent themselves flowers. Now, that is most likely because uh, somebody forgot to send them flowers and they wanted flowers, so it's a good opportunity. You know, we're not the only country, by the way, that celebrates this. There's over a billion cards given throughout the world. It's the second highest uh, card giving time next to Christmas. And just in case you needed some, a bit of trivia. The important thing is not the day. It's not whether or not you receive something is that every day that we give the love that God has given us to each other. And so I thought it would be appropriate to focus on our family, not only our flesh and blood family, but also our church family, and understanding that in the world that we live in, it's important that they see God's love, the uniqueness of it, because it's not dependent upon things, is it? Yet those things and actions do have a way of communicating it, but it's a kind of love that is unconditional, which the world has a very hard time understanding that. If you will stand with me, I'm only going to read. We're actually looking at uh, Ephesians 5, 15, all the way to 6, 4, but I'm only going to read beginning with verse 31 in, in chapter 5 of Ephesians to uh, verse 4. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love for us, that we could not love one another if it was not for the love that you gave to us through your Son, who died on the cross and shed his blood that we might have life. We pray for everyone here, Father, to know that personally, to have come into a personal relationship with you, to know that they are part of the family of God because of the faith they express to you, wanting you to be their Lord. For those that do not, Father, that they may be here, we ask that you would draw their hearts to know you completely. But for the majority of us, I pray that you will teach us that much more today about your love and how we can love others in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, all of Ephesians uh, really focuses on love much more than just this passage. This passage is the one that's known for the family. If you look back along the way in chapter 5, verse 2, you see that Paul wrote, Walk in love as Christ has loved us. Walking has a picture of a certain path that we follow, not turning on the wrong path. We know that path is following Jesus. In chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Walk as children of light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. So as we're walking in love, we're seeing the light of the Lord Jesus Christ along the path, and little by little, we, our eyes are open to what it is that we need to do to show and express this love. Because each situation, each person, there's something different that comes along our way. And then he says in verse 15 of chapter 5, 
walk circumspectly. That means carefully, accurately. And then he goes on to explain following this, uh, verse 15. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So, in walking circumspectly and walking wisely, he gives several specifics. One has to do with the feeling of the Spirit of God. We cannot be what God wants us to be apart from Him at work in our lives. We can't fake it. You can for a short period of time, but not for a long period of time. Because after a while, people see your spirit. You ever been in a situation where you've been very, very patient, and all of a sudden you lose your patience and your anger flares up and and you say, well, I've been do- waiting for hours for you to get ready. And, you know, that really ruins a special Valentine's night, doesn't it? You know, okay. In the process, uh, God's spirit goes beyond the power of our flesh. Where we want to stop, he goes further. And the only way he does that is when our mind and our heart is set upon him. The feeling of the spirit of God I've talked about before here is very simply... When we are trusting him, our faith is in him, we see the overflow of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit he speaks about in Galatians 5, and 23. That's the overflow. We can't make fruit happen. Fruit happens naturally as it gets the nourishment from the ground. The same thing as we get our nourishment from God, listen to God, obey God, it comes forth. He talks about... A joyful spirit. I really appreciate the guitar player. Nothing personally up here. But I mean, the joy just vibrated. Now, I thought to myself, is pro- I'm a musician myself. I play the guitar. I play the keyboard. But I'm very focused when I play. And it might be due to my age because all the rest of the worship team, there's a joy there. I know there's a joy there, but there's a focus. You want to be sure that music is correct. Well, he just exuberated it, and actually, it sort of freed me up in the process. Now, some of you might think, well, what's with all the movements and stuff like that? It, it's not the movement that's important. It's the joy that comes out of our life, and the Spirit of God comes out as we are seeking Him and love Him and find the joy in Him, and I'm one of these people, my wife will tell you, she will oftentimes tell me, Larry, smile. Your, your children think you're upset. Just smile, okay, because I'm a very intense, focused person. So I'm talking from one. I, I can identify with the rest of the worship team more so than with your worship leader right here, okay, because that's just my nature. You don't want to try to force it because then we become, unfortunately, like some people are trapped. There, there's, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but... Uh, it's, it's an illustration just came to my mind. If you go into a charismatic church, you find they are extremely lively, okay? And they know Baptist is what? Not being very lively. Now, we've come a long way over the years. You know, there's more Baptists that will raise their hand now and then and sway a little bit and just uh, even smile, okay, which is very helpful. But now think about this. You can get trapped in a charismatic church that you've got to come in and you've got to be lively and you've got to do all these things because if you don't, they're going to say, boy, what's wrong with you? Okay? So it's not the outward thing that is as critical as the heart and who you are expressing it that way. Does, is, is, you understand me? You hear me? This is very important as we look at loving each other because you will get trapped and say, well, I guess I better do this. The preacher said I better do this, so I'll do this to show you I love. But if that's not you, then you need to express that as you are, and we're going to get to see this a little bit more along the way. Now, beyond the expression, the melody that comes, he also talks about giving thanks in all things. That doesn't mean that you're thankful for bad, terrible, terrible things have happened. You know, this tragic accident that we saw on the news last night on the interstate, that was terrible. There's nothing good about that. You can be thankful if you came through it, if you were part of that. You can be thankful if you had family there that came through it. You can be thankful if somebody 
did end up in a tragic situation dying and getting injured that you have God to lean upon and give you hope and encouragement and comfort through this. We have a young woman that used to work at the state convention office I just found out this week, and she went to Hershey for a simple laparoscopy. They accidentally hit an artery, and she was within minutes of dying. Fortunately, there was a cardiologist, a specialist across the hall. They got in there quickly, but now she's going to be at the ICU for a while. And, you know, you say, why? Well, unfortunately, in life, these things happen. There's a lot of bad things that happen to us. You say, how can we be thankful for that? I don't have a complete explanation for you. But I do know that in Christ, even in the sorrowful times, you can be thankful. We had to put our dog, our, our, we had a little, uh, he was a terrier spaniel, a be terrier beagle mix for 19 years. And we had to uh, put him down on Monday. And, you know, he had, his last month was a very terrible month. And we just kept saying, well, maybe the Lord will just take him home, you know, naturally in this way. But then things were very bad. And. You know, that was not a joyful time when we took the dog in, Rusty, uh, in. And um, a little bit more difficult for my wife. I'm a caretaker of animals. I don't exactly hug and love on animals and let them lick my face and all that kind of thing. My wife is more that way, and so she was much more attached emotionally. But both of us, it was extremely emotional time in that way. There, there's nothing to be thankful for in that, but in the midst of the peace, to see that he was no longer suffering. He didn't eat for the last month. He went from 28 to 20 pounds, and how he survived, I don't know, uh, even with the medicine the doctor had given us to, to give to him in that way. So I hope you understand the thankfulness, the joy, that is expressed by each one of us a little differently, but you know yourself that it is there when you are walking and trusting God. And then when he says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, it's a little strange because we know we're going to get into the passage, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, but the submission is something that takes place by our will. I love what Jeff Bridges uh, writes about it in his book, The Practice of Godliness. This book actually goes back about 30 years, and he was a vice president with the Navigators at the time, but he says, what does it mean to submit to one another? Does it mean always giving in to one another's demands or opinions? Not at all. It means to submit to instruction as well as correction from other believers, to be teachable or humble enough to admit we have erred when another believer corrects us. Think of Aquila and Priscilla when they came across Apollos. Apollos is preaching about the baptism of John, and they say, oh, well, there's more, more than that. Don't you know that Jesus actually rose from the grave? Apollos didn't know, and in the correction of it, Apollos took the additional information, took their correction well, and he began to preach the full gospel because he simply did not know at the time. I don't know about you as husbands and wives, but I know about my wife and I. There are many times that I can be fairly um, determined, that's a nicer word, uh, in, in my way of doing things. And it doesn't mean it's the only way to get it done. And there are times, the older I get, I'm finding that when she says, Honey, you can do it this way, that I will actually listen and change. Change is a tough word for me. I don't like that the older I get. But it's one of the things where, in a sense, I'm submitting to her. See, we have this idea of authority. Submit to me. But really, that's not the picture that is being given here. In fact, when he gets to the passage in uh, chapter 5, beginning with verse 22, where he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. <clears throat> this is submission that is voluntarily placing yourself under another. It's like in the military. It's actually used quite often in, as a military term because, you know, you come in and you have a specific rank and you have to respect the person, or actually submit to and obey the person, that is over, even if you don't like them. Okay, and you see this a lot of times in the movies. They'll portray, you know, the situations, the tough situations in that manner. Well, the idea is one in which what Jeff Bridges shared with us is that we are saying, I am willing to trust you because you have a responsibility, I have a responsibility, and God has laid it out. There's God, 
There's the husband, there's the wife, and there's the children. You know, he, he spells that out later uh, in another passage. But for me, I have to obey God irregardless of what the world says. Now, follow me carefully here. Does submission in this manner mean that a wife does anything her husband does? No, and Acts chapter 5, verse 7 to 10, gives us an example of Ananias and Sapphira. They agreed to lie together about the money they gave to the church, making it look like, basically, they gave more than they did. And when Peter confronts Sapphira, he says, how is it that you agreed with your husband to lie about this? And, of course, she fell dead shortly thereafter. Basically, he's saying, why did you? You thought, well, well, she was just being a submissive wife. No. No, because she knew that was wrong. She knew that was sin before God. And she could have very simply said, no, I will not do that. Even before that, which is the legal authorities, you have uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter himself is before the Jewish council, which the Romans have brought him in. And you have the Jewish council and the Romans together. And Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, if you look over in Romans 13, 1 to 5, you see the passage about government and how God gave us government. Most of the governments back then were dictatorships or kingships, okay? There were not democracies at that point in time. So when Paul wrote that, you've got to keep that in mind because there were some pretty bad people. Well, what did Paul do himself? He followed that, but he was in prison. Why? Because he was proclaiming the gospel and he had false charges, and he said, I want to go all the way to Caesar. He used the government system to spread the gospel in the then-known world. And there are times that we will have to say no, and we know in the end times especially, you know, with the time of the Antichrist himself, that we'll find the real test if we're willing to say no and pay with our life or say yes so nothing really happens to us. Okay, so see... Here, Peter explains it this way in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. He says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if they don't obey the word, that could be a lost man. It could be a husband who is lost. It could also be a husband who is a Christian who is very disobedient. He's not walking in love. He's not walking in the light. He's not walking with Christ at that point in time. That they may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Now, there's some that have interpreted that, that women, you can't do that at all. But he says, merely outward, only outward. Okay, so it's not that the Bible is against you making yourself beautiful, okay, in the manner that you do. Okay, I'm just letting you know clearly because I know we live, you, especially in Lancaster County, you live in an area where that is interpreted that none of that stuff can be done. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. That's the intent. That's what God is using. Now, the other element when he talks about respecting in this passage, if you go to the end of it and he says, uh, verse 33, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Respect is the high regard, honor, and esteem in uh, Willard, Willard Hartley Jr.'s book, His Needs, Her Needs, he writes, here's a list of the major needs of men that he's found in his study and work over the years. Intimate physical fulfillment, recreational companionship, physical attraction, domestic support, and admiration. Admiration would be in the area where he talks about a woman respecting, a wife respecting him. In Sh Jeff and Shanti Feldham's book, For Women Only, which was done as a result of a survey of about 1,400 men, they discovered 74% of the men said if he feels disrespected, he feels unloved. If he feels disrespected, he feels unloved. So, so this is a different way that men and women are seeing love, expecting love. And to be respected is just that when I you know, say, I think we should do this, I think we should go here, my wife doesn't have to say, yes, sir, yes, Lord, okay? And I realize in the Scripture it said that Sarah called her husband Lord. Now, you can do that, uh, women. That's perfectly fine. If you want to go home today and call your husband Lord, that's fine, 
Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But the idea is that you're letting him know, yes, I will consider this. I think this is a good... Even if you disagree, you know, unless it's sinful, it's okay to show the respect in that manner. Now, for husbands, he goes on to say, in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that... She should be holy and without blemish. Husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Now, loving your wife. <clears throat> Obviously, that word is the agapeo word. It's the unconditional love. It's giving of yourself completely. It's the picture of marriage where it's 100% husband, 100% wife, committed to 100% of each other. It's not a 50-50 relationship. Now, in doing that, you have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility, leading our wives to know the love of God through his word. Okay, when it talks about, in verse 26 and 27, to sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, referring to the scriptures, we cannot make our wives holy. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that makes us... But we can lead them in that way. I don't know if my wife and I have most of the mornings of the week, at least five or six. We have a, a devotional book we use. We have a list of the missionaries. And, I, you know, this is a side note. You know, you support thousands of missionaries, many of which had to come off the field, you know, during December. I hope you will find a means. There are several different ways in which you can find the names or the initials, those that are in difficult areas, to pray for them. You know, if we're going to be involved in supporting the missionaries around the world, why not at least pray for them each day? They list them by their birthday. It takes about five minutes even to read their names, and then now and then they'll highlight one. We use the missions mosaic, uh, which have, but there's a, a number of things that you can get. But that's just a side note. Pray for those that we are supporting and that are bringing the gospel to other places that we can't go personally. Now, do something, even if it's just a scripture passage, but to bring the word between the two of you. Actually, if you're, if you're having some difficulties, there's no greater way to begin to see healing of that through the word of God. Now, in terms of nourishing her, as you go down and you look in verse 28, where he says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Um, verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. To nourish is just to provide the basic needs uh, for her. In Hartley's book, again, His Needs, Her Needs, he lists the major needs of a woman as affection, Intimate conversation, honesty, openness, financial support, family commitment. And, Shanti, and uh, the Shanti's book, for men, men only, in which they got um, the feedback, I think it was over 3,000 women. Uh, I don't know why they needed more women than men for the survey, but whatever the case was, that's how this came about. It said that the majority of women want emotional security and closeness. And I hear that emotional security. Most men want to what? Provide for their home. Work hard. Bring in the money. Pay the bills. Nice house. Nice things for their wife and their children. But what they really want deep down is have that sense that I know I'm going to be okay with you. I know we're going to be together. I know you're going to take care of me. And this is why sometimes you end up with a difficulty of well, I work hard. I work 60, 70, 80 hours a week to provide everything you need, and you can't understand why your wife and children are not very thankful for that. Because deep down, they're wanting that emotional security more so than just the... It's not that they don't want financial security, but the emotional security is more so than. Gary Chapman, and this is a whole uh, different message in itself, but he has a great uh, material I'm sure most of you have seen to some degree, but he talks about... Feeling love versus knowing your love. You know, most, he said most people know that 
when you said the vows, I love you, I love you. And you meant it. But over time, you make an assumption. And people need to know that in their own way, you're doing something to help them feel love. And he explains, I'm going to do this super quick, because I know every time I preach here, I seem like I preach all the way up to Sunday school, and I'm really trying to get this down to where we can be out in time, and you can go. But the five love languages he talks about, some people like affirmation. He calls words of praise. Some people like you doing things, helping them. He calls that acts of service. Some people like just a hug. He refers to physical touch. Some people like receiving a nice gift. And some people like that focused time together, what you might refer to as quality time. Well, If you're trying to show love to someone in your way, and that's not their way, that's why they will not feel loved even though they will see it. I'm an acts of service person. I think I've shared this before in one of the times. You know, I will do things. Yesterday, I got into the um, Mr. Clean uh, mode, and so, you know, I was uh, scrubbing and cleaning floors, the hardwood floors, and rearranging the furniture and getting stuff away because we're hopefully going to put our house up for sale. If anybody wants to move to Windsor, by the way, that's a side note, let me know. I've got a nice home that will go on the market in April, uh, Lord willing, uh, for especially for a retired couple. It's a small home, but very, very nice in that way. But anyways, I was in one of those moves. Well, I didn't spend very much time with my wife from about early afternoon until about 8 o'clock at night when I went to bed. Because I was just in that mode, and, do, and she was very thankful, but my wife likes time together and a lot of affirmation. Okay, but the night before, on Friday night, we went out to El Serrano's in Lancaster, and so I had focused attention and time, and so I gave her that then, okay. So I know what she needs, but I'm always working out of my love language, acts of service, whereas her love language is more... That's, she will spend time, she will listen for hours to someone. Just be a listening ear, say very little, but console them and help them, encourage them. So know how it is. This applies to your children, too, because children are different. That's why sometimes you go out and you get them a really nice gift, and they say, oh, thanks, and they walk away. What's the deal? I worked hard. That cost a lot of money. You probably would have gotten more from them if it was a young boy, maybe just playing baseball with him a little, throwing a ball back and forth, you know. That would have probably been more. Or maybe just taking some time to listen to your daughter and let her tell you all about the things that she's doing, et cetera, like that. We need to know and listen to one another. It's very important. Now, cherishing. Um, cherishing is making someone feel special. These flowers up front, you know, you want to take special care of them. You don't want to just throw them around because they'd fall apart. And so as husbands, we are to cherish our wives, to treat them in a manner. He says, husbands, likewise, dwell with them. This is 1 Peter 3, 7. With understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Uh, Notice that your prayers may not be hindered. If you've been praying for a while and feel like God is not answering your prayers, you might want to reevaluate, men, how you're treating your wives, okay? And, and uh, for all of us, it's a constant daily thing to consider. Do they know that I love them? That's very important. Even making the time, I spent several days asking my wife where she would like to go, and she didn't tell me. And I got a little frustrated. Finally, I said, you want me to do this, don't you? She said, yes, <laughs> okay. So I then finally made the decision where we'll go, et cetera, in that manner. So I just I figure, why not just ask her then? I know I'm doing something that she really wants, right? So, but then it puts her in the one making the decision. Sometimes she wants to know that I love her because I've chosen to do Man, I, I, I've been married 41 years, and I'm still working to understand my wife. Uh, it's, it's good to work on that way, but that's, you know, just where life is. Now... I love in uh, the book by Holly Faith Phillips. So what does she want from me anyways? Man, if you haven't read that, it's a good book. So what does she want from me anyways? Without going through the long list, I mean, it's like a list of about 15 major things. She says that at the end of the list, no one person can or was meant to meet all of our needs as women. Only God can. The intent was to help men understand 
what some of those needs are. So that's just a little word of encouragement. Now, for all of us, <clears throat> we need to remember the process is going back to what I said in the beginning, walking with the Lord, walking in love with him, walking in the light. Because, see, if this is me and this is my wife, and we're both walking after the Lord, we grow closer together by focusing on him because neither of us can completely satisfy or fulfill the needs of either one. Same thing with children in the family. Walking after him, obeying the Lord as parents and as children, and you, the more you grow closer to the Lord, you grow closer together in that way. Because we are going to drop the ball on a lot of things with our children. You know, I've raised four. You know, we've got eight grandkids and, you know, uh, learning to try to spend different time with them. And, uh, wow, I, I don't know what people do that have 20 and some odd uh, grandkids and how you even spend time and focus on that. So you things fall along the way, but as you seek the Lord and they see that love, even the short time and the things you can do, that becomes extremely important. In chapter 6, we see children are to obey uh, their parents in verse 1. To honor them is extremely important. And then fathers are not to provoke them to wrath, but to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In honoring them, it simply means that we regard them with great, with great respect. You know, my father passed away a year ago this past summer, and uh, I still honor, you know, my mother. Uh, I did my father. I just um, They just gave way, way more of themselves for us. And even since he's gone, I've learned an awful lot. He had no idea. My son found a book uh, called The History of Lockheed. He worked for Lockheed Martin for 30-some years. And here, there's a lot written about my dad in the book. Had no idea. Some of my my mother even said I sent her some of the material. Said I never even knew this story about your father, et cetera, and the type of work that he did. But you know, to to listen to them, to respect them, to know that they are working hard to provide for you, and that's that's important because there are parents who could care less. There are children who are rebellious because their parents did not try to love them. We're not perfect as parents, so just be patient with us because it is extremely difficult, to, especially if you have multiple children, to try to know these things. I've, you know, preaching is easy. It's living it out that is more difficult. Believe me. Believe me. And then uh, the important thing, too, I want to close with has to do with just general communication. <clears throat> Communication, Dr. Norman Wright says in his book, without communication, there is no relationship. Communication is to love what blood is to the body. You take blood out of the body and it dies. Take communication away and a relationship dies. And communication involves words, our tone of our words, and our body language. Dennis Rainey, wrote in his book, Staying Close, you can share a bed, eat at the same table, watch the same TV, share the same bank account, parent the same children, and talk and not communicate and still feel all alone. You don't have to say a lot of words to communicate. You don't have to be somebody you're not to communicate. You do have to understand the other person enough to know that when they blink their eyes, when they nod their head, when they, mm, that they have said something to you and that over the years you understand what that is. Okay? You all know that women speak more words than men in general. Okay? So that's obvious. The thing about it is what are you listening to? You know, my wife is always getting on to me because... I will hear her, but I don't necessarily listen well. And she discovers that when I got the wrong thing out of the cupboard, when I went and uh, called the wrong person or said the wrong thing. Even my children, my, my two daughters in particular, tell me at times, Dad, that's not what I said. Well, that's what I thought I heard, but I wasn't exactly focusing on it. So it's important for us to know that it's a two-way street. It's the same thing with the Lord. If you spend all your time praying to him and never reading the word of God, 
you hear him when you read the word of God and you listen intently. It's the same way in a relationship, not just in a marriage, but any relationship. In communication, Gary Smalley writes, a big problem with communication is unresolved anger. In his book uh, that goes back, oh, 25 years ago, in Making Love Last Forever, many people have things and hurts from the past, and they make an assumption that when you say something and do something, and they see a mannerism, that it brings up something from the past, and so they're going to respond in that way. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who is going to heal that and are going to enable you to find peace in that way with that. But Gary uh, has this, and I'll close with this. He says, these are five vital signs of a healthy marriage, which it can also be of a healthy relationship in general. Number one, everyone feels safe to think for themselves. Number two, everyone is encouraged to talk and to know their words will be valued. Number three, Everyone enjoys a sense of safety and value in sharing their feelings with one another. Number four, everyone feels meaningfully connected. And number five, the personal property lines of all are respected. What that last one very simply means is there are things in which you say, you know what, I, I don't want to go there right now. I don't want to talk about this right now. And you respect them and say, okay, I won't talk about that right now. I won't go there right now. But sometime I'm willing to listen. Those are the areas where there's deep hurts, the deep things that are unresolved. And allow yourself to say, it's okay. It's okay. I am not good at trying to resolve conflict at night. I was in bed at 8.30 last night. Okay, Not asleep till 10, but basically we're... Okay, my wife is the late night person. I'm the early morning person. She's not the best to resolve things early in the morning. So we have to find a time in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, early evening. Okay, you need to understand these lines that work best for you together. Jesus said uh, in, in God's word, we're told in um, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long as it kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Love never fails, but now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God within us, can give us this kind of love. Let's stand together, and as I pray, just remember, God is the one who will enable you to love your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your fellow family members in the church as he desires. That's why we need to walk in love, walk in light, walk after him. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the spirit of God that you've sent within us the day that we were saved. We do pray, Father, for anyone here that has never come into that relationship, that does not know this kind of love, that, God, you would bring them to salvation today. And for the majority of us that claim the name of Christ, claim you as Lord, that, God, we would resolve those things that are hindering our relationships in the home, in the church, Father, in our community, at work, wherever it might be, that people would see the fruit of the Spirit of God in us. In Jesus' name, for your glory. Amen.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day that we've had to come to worship you. Now, as we go to the various Sunday school classes, Father, help us to see the specific things you want us to do, you want us to learn, you want us to know, that we may be better followers of you. And we continue to pray, Father, for healing of hearts, for comfort that is needed, for your continued work in each of us throughout this day. In Jesus' name, for your glory. Amen. Ready? One, two, three, four.